Future Eaters website at www.abc.net.au slash science. Ever since the time the first Europeans arrived, we've altered nature so much that we've become an external... Instead, they convinced themselves that Australia was a terra nullius, an empty land, there for the taking. In New Zealand, after decades of warfare and broken treaties, the Maori were finally subdued. War and disease so decimated the Aborigines and Maori that it seemed that they'd be part of the next wave of extinctions in Australasia. For many Europeans, it was convenient and inevitable, a process of natural selection. And the lands themselves, despite their great age, they christened them the New Lands, New Zealand, New Caledonia, New Guinea, and the great island continent of New Holland, later renamed Australia. When Captain James Cook first saw this place, he described it as being like a gentleman's park. For the British, Cook's description brought to mind the richest and most fertile of lands, but in this vision of an Arcadia, they were badly deceived. The land supported a rich diversity of extraordinary wildlife. But in reality, this diversity had evolved in one of the most nutrient-poor regions on the planet. Only creatures and plants that were highly energy efficient thrived here. Far from discovering a land of plenty, the colonists had set foot on some of the poorest soils in the world. But that wasn't all. This land had another bitter lesson in store for those who misunderstood it. As the explorers pushed inland, they expected to find a living river system, an Amazon or a Mississippi. But instead, this is what they discovered. A great river system indeed, but one that only flowed once or twice a decade. When it rains, water from distant storms flows down the dry creeks, releasing precious nutrients stored in their beds. It can quickly become a flood carrying massive volumes of water across the continent. This is a time of plenty, a trigger for new life. Native fish that have been trapped in the billabongs can now travel to their breeding grounds. Birds like cormorants gorge themselves in the rich waters. Even the infertile soil blooms with such an abundance of life that the land can appear as rich as that of Europe. A drought has always followed. The native animals have evolved to survive with it. But it brought disaster to the new arrivals. People that sat around this fireplace dreamed of establishing a pastoral empire here at Old Kanyaka. In the 19th century, the son of an English aristocrat came out to this country during a good year and decided to sink the family fortune into the place. Pretty soon he'd built this village with 70 people living in it. But then in 1864, the inevitable drought hit and he had to walk away. He had to abandon his newly built English manor house, leaving the family dreams and their fortune in ruins. Despite disasters like this, 
Each good season saw more and more farmers move onto the land. Government policy actually forced them to carry at least four times the density of sheep as today. The result was wholesale massacre of the native pastures by hoof and jaw. When the next drought came, it brought catastrophe. In this very spot in the Flinders Ranges, 40,000 sheep died in just one season. Those sheep didn't die of thirst, they died of starvation. So basically they ate everything that was here, uh, completely and utterly gone. Uh, their hooves sort of pounded uh, the soil into a powder. Uh, the first rains came along, it all washed away, and, and as a result we've got this gully erosion. Now, that may have been OK. Uh, the country may have survived with that, uh, given some, mo uh, some more good years, but hot on the heels of that 1880 drought came the rabbits. It was bad enough that the new invaders overstocked the land, but they even brought their own pests with them. Rabbits, foxes, and a whole menagerie of other European creatures. two native predators capable of holding back these introduced pests. The wedge-tailed eagle is a lethal hunter. It's one of the world's largest raptors. The other natural defender was the dingo. It can even kill foxes and cats. But their European traditions taught the farmers that these natural predators were in fact the pests. They were systematically wiped out by bounty hunters. Now, introduced species like the fox, rabbit and feral cat could spread unchallenged across the continent in plague proportions, triggering a hundred years of ecological turmoil. Across the Tasman Sea in New Zealand, the colonists were repeating the same mistakes made in Australia, with devastating consequences for wildlife. These fertile, temperate islands were more familiar to the Europeans than the unpredictable dry lands of Australia. When the settlers first arrived, 60% were still ancient forests of cowrie, beech and podocar. All of them singing with life. For this was a land of birds. On the forest floor, they found unique creatures like the Chuatara, a 200 million year old throwback to the prehistoric continent of Gondwana. And the mouse sized giant wetter, the largest cricket in the world. Despite being hunted by the Maori, many flightless birds like the Takahei still survived. With no ground-based mammal carnivores, life for this army of flightless foragers had been relatively easy. But not even the national bird, the kiwi, was safe from the impact of the latest human arrivals. New Zealand's wildlife had evolved in isolation for something like 70 million years, and that meant that it was superbly adapted to the special conditions of New Zealand. But it came at a great cost, for that same isolation meant that New Zealand's plants and animals were extremely vulnerable to change. As in Australia, 
the first settlers cleared the forests, triggering a cascade of environmental change. On steeper slopes, the clearing and burning often led to erosion, and there was inevitable species loss. But the sheep and cattle flourished, generating one of the highest standards of living in the world. Flush with wealth from exports of meat and wool, the colonists set about building another England. Recreational activities were imported from the old country, but there was a severe shortage of creatures to hunt. So a huge variety of alien species was brought in and set free. Rabbits proved to be the same ecological disaster that they were in Australia. Here too, they quickly reached plague proportions. In an attempt to control them, carnivorous mammals were introduced. But the hundreds of ferrets, stoats and weasels found it easier to hunt the native birds, especially the flightless ones, which were much less elusive than the fleet-footed rabbit. As these mammal predators multiplied, their effect upon the native birds became catastrophic. And soon another, even larger carnivore was to stalk the woods. Thousands of feral cats, descendants of those first brought in as pets, went wild and began to prey on the bird life of the islands, already under siege from rats and other predators. Not even the mountain grasslands and forests were safe from the new invaders. Red deer, brought in to be hunted, quickly multiplied, becoming a national pest. As well as overgrazing grasslands, they gorged themselves on the new growth in the native forest, turning the forest floor into a wasteland. The only part of the native vegetation that seemed to be safe from the invasion was the higher canopy of the forest. It's up here that many of the native birds feed and nest. They also play a vital role in regenerating the forest. By eating fruit and nectar, they pollinate plants and distribute seeds in their droppings. that the dense green canopies of the native forest were changing colour and dying. The culprit was yet another introduced creature, the Australian brush-tailed possum. This leaf-eating marsupial had been imported to establish a fur industry. No one imagined then that it might threaten the very forests of New Zealand, or that it could be responsible for the disappearance of many native birds, like the kokako. After decades, infrared cameras finally confirmed people's worst fears. 
the supposedly vegetarian possum had been preying on the eggs and chicks of native birds all along. Soon, the situation for the nation's forests and birds was critical. There were estimated to be around 70 million possums on the loose, devouring the equivalent of 4,000 football fields of native forests every day. If I could have walked here 200 years ago, I would have seen a forest that was alive with the calls of thousands of birds. But ever since the Europeans have arrived, this forest has been slowly silenced, and most of the birds that lived here are now extinct. All of those pollinators of plants, and dispersers of seeds, and eaters of insect pests are all gone. It's as if the fabric of the entire ecosystem has just been torn apart. Australia's forests and grasslands were suffering from a different problem. The Aboriginal system of managing the land through fire had gone. The Europeans had put an end to it. This fire stick farming had played an important role in sustaining the medium-sized marsupials. The Rufus hair wallaby is rarely sighted today. Yet just a century ago, it was one of Australia's most common animals. The brush-tailed betong was also widespread throughout the country. And the bilby would have been familiar to all the Aboriginal people of inland Australia. But now, all these animals are teetering on the brink of extinction. The demise of the marsupials has been silent and almost invisible. Want to hold that one? Yeah. Thank you. The only people who witnessed the process are the desert Aborigines. And it happened so recently that elders like Chilpy Nugget still remember hunting and eating these animals. Nugget lives near Uluru, a place where Aborigines have been given title to their land. It's one of the few areas where traditional land management has been reintroduced using fire stick farming. It's out here in the arid zone that the loss has been highest. Scientists from South Australia are conducting a fauna survey to discover the extent of the damage and to see if the few survivors are still breeding. Little one. Little one. Oh, wow. They're working together with the Nangu Pichanjara people, custodians of this land. Middle claw doesn't protrude. Yeah, because they get torn off on rocks. Yeah. We can see only one, one place now. Where, the, where some only few of all of these are now. 
And there's one colony just in this area here, and then there's another colony about 40 kilometres to the west from here. Mm -hmm. And that's all that we've been able to find in the last five or six years working with, mm -hmm. with Anangu. Yeah. Also, it's got a pouch on. Well, this beautiful little waru, this rock wallaby, is an endangered species today. Yet when these fellas were young, they were everywhere through this country. There's so many species of our marsupials that have suffered the same fate. 23 of them are extinct, and this really is the last survivor among the middle-sized mammals in the whole of this region. An important part of the study is to document the knowledge of the traditional owners of the land and to forge a partnership that will help sustain the remaining wildlife. So you want to be able to pick your right uh, places through the spinifex. Mm. <laughs> ah, got a knob tail. Mm. The invaluable knowledge of the elders is being recorded and shared with the wider world. Pero mm. Pewea? So, any kuchu, just one name? Wara, not. And what are we just saying that it lives in the, in the Chanpi here, in, in the Spinifex? People have been, have come away from a lot of their country and spent much more time away from it. As a consequence, they haven't been doing hunting over as broader area of the country, haven't been using fire uh, for a range of uh, purposes. And because of that, um, the, um, the vegetation has got uh, uh, older post-fire and then lightning strikes have taken out much, much broader areas of country than um, used to occur when uh, traditional owners were on their country and burning in patches that provided a range of habitats for a big range of animals. The kind of knowledge that's been shared here is extraordinarily complex and detailed, and it's been built up over generations by these Aboriginal people. I guess it's the only way that they've been able to survive in this extraordinarily harsh land. And we're in the middle of that process now. Us Europeans are trying to adapt to this same kind of country for the long term. And the knowledge that's being shared there is probably our best guide as to how we can do that. After all, these people are the only people who have ever lived here in the long term. In New Zealand, the extinction crisis has gone much further than in Australia. By the 1970s, it was realised that the nation was perilously close to losing almost everything. Among many others on the brink of extinction was the flightless night parrot, the kakapo. Living in burrows had made it particularly vulnerable to feral predators. Only 57 survive, and most of them are male. Just one new female has been found in the last 20 years. The last male kakapo boom forlornly, all night and every night, in a vain attempt to attract a mate that will almost certainly never come. It was vital to save not just the kakapo, but all the remnant populations of native creatures that were left. In many cases, they'd only survived on tiny offshore islands, protected from feral predators by the ocean. These islands were of enormous ecological importance. They were to become lifeboats for New Zealand's wildlife. We noticed that there were um, islands that had species remaining on them. Um, that were now no longer found in the mainland. But often one island just had one species on it. And by removing um, feral animals from uh, islands, we were able to bring a lot of extra species to them. So now we have quite a few islands um, that are lifeboats for the animals that were native to New Zealand.
Over the last decade, the entire known population of Kakapo have been moved to island lifeboats. It's hoped that here, in the absence of predators, the last of the night parrots will breed successfully. But not all of the 700 offshore islands were safe. The rat had already reached many of them, posing a severe threat. Systematic poisoning campaigns were waged, and New Zealand quickly became a world leader in controlling feral pests. Something like 70 islands have now been cleared of these introduced mammals paving the way for more and more ambitious species recovery programs. It's pretty clear that New Zealand will never be able to get rid of all of its introduced predators, but maybe they can be controlled, especially here on the offshore island lifeboats, where some native species are down to just a handful of individuals. And they may be coming back from the brink, and if that's so, it'll be an amazing conservation achievement. The next stage of the lifeboats program is to see where the principles developed on islands can be used on the mainland. Rotoiti National Park in the mountains of the South Island is home to another endangered parrot, the kaka. We had people out here for the last few days to swim left. Transit, sort of Rotoiti uh, is one of the first mainland lifeboats to be established. This is a, looks an intact forest. We're in the, the national park here. And the key problem are the introduced pests found in these forests. So that's a wide range of mammals, both predators and herbivores. So we've got possums, rats, mice, stoats, probably a few feral cats. And then we've got sort of pests that people really aren't thinking of as pests, like the wasp. We have large densities of common wasps in these forests. And you'll see the honeydew that's on the bark of, of a number of the trees here. That provides a very high energy resource which allows wasps you know, to build up large numbers in the summer. Honeydew is a high protein sap-like liquid exuded by an insect hidden inside the bark of trees. It's a vitally important food. There's hardly a creature in the forest that doesn't depend on this energy source to some extent. But 10 years ago, this vital life support system was disrupted when another invader from Europe arrived here, the common wasp. With no natural enemies, it was able to breed at will, filling the forest with its constant buzzing. It also preyed in swarms on the insects, another vital source of food for birds. In 1995, it was realised that the breeding cycle of the kaka had been disrupted. The wasps were thought to be partly to blame. A wasp eradication program began, using baits of poison cat food. Soon, the baiting will be tried on a forest-wide basis. The other reason for the kaka's decline was the large number of mammal predators in the forest. Unlike true islands, these pest mammals can reinvade mainland islands easily. So really the big challenge at mainland island sites is to control that reinvasion rate of things like possums and rats and cats and stoats. And that's really the big challenge which we've yet to get fully under control. The impact of feral predators 
was poignantly demonstrated when the kaka finally began to breed again. One pair of birds did commence mating. An old male had been joined in the forest by a young female. Two chicks were born to the pair and monitoring at the nest site began. But sadly, it soon became apparent why the number of females had declined. Before the chicks had fledged, the young kaka hen disappeared and was tracked by radio to an old log. The guilty party was almost certainly a stoat. Hens on their nests are sitting targets. It explained the drastic decline in the numbers of female birds. This year, close to Rotoiti Lake, the kaka have been breeding again. And now the nests have been protected on a forest-wide basis. Yeah, so Tim, this is one of our protected trees here. And you see the sheet of aluminium around the base, which is designed to prevent stoats climbing the tree. And um, the entrance is up the top there, and below that, you can see a small patch of aluminium. That's where I've actually cut a hole to get access to the chicks. Conservation field officers make regular checks on the nest sites to ensure the chicks are being properly nurtured. It's a delicate operation, needing skilled hands. What we've focused on really uh, in mainland island sites recently have been suites, different suites of introduced mammals. And so right here, it's really those mammals plus the wasps, which are our focus. If we can control, effectively control those, we'll really be starting to talk about real ecosystem restoration at the mainland. Come and have a look at this. It's the, the first oh. of our, our crop of the year. Wow, what a beauty. To some degree, we have to put the chicks in perspective a bit. I think a really important thing is that the female birds haven't been preyed on. They can always make more chicks, but if you lose those female birds, we can't, you know, replace them. With many of our species, extinction can actually be quite an insidious, you know, almost a surreptitious sort of thing. The animals are long-lived, so they actually survive a long time, so you get the impression they're still around, but, and it's often maybe just a specific, specific sex or age that's vulnerable to predation. So in the case of kaka, it seems to be primarily female birds and young that are vulnerable to predation. So you can get the impression there's still a lot of kaka there, but actually that may be a heavily male bias sex ratio. What a bird. Wow. Jeez. It's only recently that people have started to value New Zealand's unique ecosystems. But the challenge to hang on to what's left is enormous. You just can't undo 800 years ecological damage in a decade, or even a century. But to make matters worse, the cascade of changes flowing through this forest now are so profound, they just have to result in many, many more extinctions. The battle to save New Zealand's unique ecosystems has really only just begun. As the people of New Zealand fight to turn the extinction tide, Australians are still struggling to come to terms with the ecological damage caused by previous generations. Australia's environmental crisis isn't just about disappearing wildlife, but the degradation of the land itself. And it's all because we, the third wave of future eaters, misunderstood this country from the very beginning. The mistakes continued well into the 20th century. The scramble for wealth drove agriculture ever onwards into the more and more marginal land. wasn't really farming in the sustainable sense. 
it was more like mining the soil. The few nutrients that had sustained this ecosystem for thousands of years were used up by just a few crops of wheat, and then the land was ruined. Our rivers too came under attack. When it began in 1949, the Snowy Mountain Scheme was one of the engineering wonders of the world. Australia was driven by a vision of becoming another America, a nation of hundreds of millions feeding the world. Controlling the unpredictable cycle of drought and flood was thought to be the key. Today, so much of the Murray River's water is used for irrigation that only a third of its flow ever reaches the sea. The Murray-Darling system was the lifeline for over 30,000 wetland areas that depended on a cycle of drought and flood. The river's waters were once rich in native fish, but today the Murray Cod, Australia's largest freshwater species, is already extinct in large tracts of the river. The wetlands ecosystems are dying from either being permanently dry or constantly full of water that drowns the majestic river red gums. The powerful technology of the third wave of future eaters did eventually make the land yield. And Australians won a lucrative bounty from wool and wheat. But the cost has been enormous. Once the native trees were cleared, the water table rose, bringing salt to the surface, rendering the land useless. And every time the drought returns, more and more of the precious topsoil is blown off the land. Millions of tonnes are lost to erosion every year. In 1983, a dust storm enveloped Melbourne plunging the city into twilight. In just one afternoon, Australia lost $4 million in nutrients alone, blown away forever across the Tasman Sea. The same winds that blow away the soil fan the bushfires that rage on the edge of our cities plunging whole communities into crisis. And these bushfires too are a man-made catastrophe, a legacy of leaving the land unmanaged by the Aborigines. For the fire stick was extinguished here over 200 years ago. to me like we're not in control here. In fact, us Europeans never have been, because we still haven't learned how to live with this country. We've tried to transplant a foreign heart into a different body, and we're seeing all the signs of a massive rejection. And if we keep on trying to treat our country like this, and keep on trying to ride it so hard, we're going to kill it. And that's what I mean by future eating. So far, we've been making a living at the country's expense. But it doesn't have to be like this. Now one in every three farmers, 24,000 of them, belong to Landcare. They're committed to making a living here sustainable. 
They're doing it by observing their country carefully, studying the fine detail of how it works. Out here, on the edge of the Simpson Desert, hard experience has taught graziers not to be greedy, to move their cattle on at the first sign of pasture degradation. For it's all too easy to overstock this land. The artesian water here comes to the surface under great pressure. That did it. That did it. That did it. At Dulcan Inner Station, Darrell Bell is actually using the water to minimise the impact of his cattle on the land. He pipes the underground water to storage tanks, placed in areas of good growth. The water keeps the cattle in an area that can sustain them. At the first sign their food is being depleted, another tank is activated and the cattle moved on, leaving the land to recover. I think one of our major secrets is the invention of polypipe and polythene tanks and fibreglass tanks. You can move stock onto little lots of water and they can sustain there for a long, long time left alone. It's all the more remarkable because he's doing it in one of the driest places on earth that supports a pastoral industry. I guess you must get a lot of people to come out here and look at this country and say, well, gee, it looks pretty hard. I don't know how you do it. But, uh... Yes, I suppose, well, we are on an edge of a desert, but uh, it's um, very robust. It, at the same time, um, very um, fragile, but it's more robust than a lot of people give it credit for. And you've got to be kind to it, and it'll be kind to you, but if you abuse it, then it'll break you. Much of Australia is rangelands, unsuitable for growing crops, but ideal for meat production. Kangaroos and emus are the only large land animals that are perfectly adapted to this country. Both have the potential to be harvested sustainably and profitably over vast areas of the continent. And they taste good too. It's cost our environment nothing to produce this kangaroo steak. But the cost of making this loaf of bread has been enormous. We lose seven kilograms of irreplaceable soil for every kilogram of wheat we grow here. And it's no exaggeration to say that what we eat today will shape our country's future. We can either continue to eat at our country's expense or we can find ways to feed ourselves that's in tune with its nature. The saltwater crocodile has been here for at least four million years. Now, in the Northern Territory, people are beginning to raise crocodiles for meat and skins, turning the tables from crocodiles eating us to us eating them. As Graham Webb argues, there's both a conservation and economic logic to farming and eating these creatures. It's just very simple. Any animal or plant you want to look at, if it has a high value, either for skin and meat or just because it's beautiful, people will look after it. If it has a low or a negative value, if it's eating your cattle and eating your sheep or something like that, then you pay money to get rid of it. If it has no value, which is what, no tangible value, then it's very easily replaced. And, and that's the problem with, with wildlife conservation on a global scale, that people are frightened to put a value on, but if it doesn't have a value, it's going to be replaced. It's not just our wildlife that needs to be valued. Water is the other great natural resource that we've been literally giving away. It's been squandered to create enormous wealth for few. And until we put a true economic value on water, it will never be managed sustainably. More than anything else, our future lies in how we manage this land. Kakadu National Park is one of Australia's premier world heritage areas. Its complex ecology of wetlands, rainforests and grasslands has been managed by the Aborigines alone for the last 40,000 years.
Aboriginal people have been burning this place for more generations than you can count. In fact, much of what you see around in terms of the vegetation and the landscape has been sculpted by fire. It's a product of fire. And uh, it's necessary for us, in, in partnership with the Aboriginal people, to, to maintain that, to maintain the status quo. Because if we don't, if we become shy of fire, the way perhaps people are in southern Australia, we're going to have a, a pyrotechnic anarchy develop in this country, which will probably result in really severe late season hot fires in the late dry season, which are very destructive. Despite all that's happened to them, Aboriginal knowledge of how to manage this land with fire has survived. Now it's being applied using modern technology. The traditional rubbing together of sticks has been replaced by incendiary capsules thrown from the air. The idea is to burn on a controlled but widespread basis in order to prevent destructive hot bushfires triggered by lightning in the dry season. The fire stick has been revived on a grand scale. What we do is to use technology to mimic what they used to do. So with the aid of, of satellite imagery, helicopters, incendiary capsules and a whole range of other things, quad motorbikes, you name it. We use all these high-tech methods to achieve the same result that Aboriginal people got by doing it with Banksia cones and walking on foot maybe, you know, 50, 100 years ago, right back into the far distant past. One thing is certain though, neither Australia nor New Zealand can build a sustainable future without the support of their people. A trip to one of the latest of New Zealand's island lifeboats shows just how far the public is behind this national conservation program. Just a few kilometres offshore from Auckland lies the island of Tiritiri Matanga. It looks green now, but 10 years ago it was barren, overgrazed pastureland given over to goats. Today the island is almost entirely covered in forest again and it's being used as a lifeboat sanctuary for rare birds like the flightless takahe. It's one of the uh, first takahe released on the island. Uh, they still have one of their chicks uh, from last year helping them but that chick there is this year's chick. It's amazing. That bird was thought to be extinct for a century. I yes. can't believe I'm looking at the thing now. The transformation has been achieved mostly by volunteers, over a hundred or so of whom appear every weekend, joined by boatloads of children in their holidays. Over a hundred thousand native trees have already been planted. If real results are to be achieved and wastelands turn back to forest again, the wholesale support of communities is essential on both a national and a local scale. Most of it's been planted by school children. We used to bring them in here as part of an education program, set them out with a few trees, talk to them about the vegetation and they'd sit out and plant the trees. But it's been quite wonderful how it's changed in that short length of time. Yes, gee, I'd love to come back in 10 or 20 years and see what it'd be like. You give it another 20 years, these would be three to four times the height of they are now and it'll, it'll really be a wonderful little forest. Eventually, the new forest will grow to resemble this, the last relic of pristine forest left on the island. Its canopy alive once again with the sound of native birds. Oh, what an incredibly beautiful place. You can just hear the health of the ecosystem in all these birds that are mostly gone from New Zealand forests. 
And just 10 years ago, most of this island was just pasture. I'm just amazed at what people can do when the whole community works together, pretty single-mindedly, to restore something like this. It's all too easy for urban people to forget about environmental problems like species loss and the degradation of soil and water. But it's the cities where most people live and ultimately they'll decide the future of this land. Urban people especially need to assess their lifestyles and decide what kind of consumption levels are sustainable in these lands what level of population can be supported and how much of our unique natural heritage can be retained. Each wave of human invaders into this region has changed its very nature. But eventually, they've learned to live sustainably in these fragile lands. Except, that is, for us. The third and final wave of the Future Eaters. My people came ashore at this place just over 200 years ago. And ever since then, they've been acting as if they never left Europe. Well, the time has come now for us to become real Australasians to learn to respect the uniqueness of these most fragile of lands and to live within their limits and to let their rhythms and their starkness and grandeur sit easily in our spirits. That was the final episode of The Future Eaters. You can find the book of the series at ABC Shops. Stay with us now for a look at next week's program. Due to extended news coverage of today's election announcement, from 7.30 tonight, all programs will be running half an hour later than advertised and 45 minutes later in Tasmania. Visit the Future Eaters website and have your say in the debate.